what we did was we looked across all of the gynecologic carcinosarcomas mm -hmm. sarcomas because we had a sneaking suspicion that maybe they're all related and where they happen to pop up is just random entropy. It doesn't necessarily okay. reflect how we should be treating it. Mm -hmm. Or maybe the molecular drivers that make carcinosarcomas happen are the same in the fallopian tube, in the ovary, in the uterus, in the vagina. Uh -huh. And so we were able to use sort of the vast tumor bank of Mass General to obtain tissue. Uh -huh. and then we actually interrogated the tissue for specific gain of function oncogenic mutations. We queried it for about 150 or so mutations and basically distilled each individual tumor down to its DNA and RNA and were able to genotype each one. What we found was fascinating. Fallopian tube carcinosarcomas are very, very rare, mm -hmm. but they tend to look just like ovarian yeah. carcinosarcomas. Mm -hmm. Vaginal, we only had two out of, in our entire cohort of approximately 70 to 80. Mm -hmm. So it was hard to draw firm conclusions, but we didn't see any clear pattern of gain-of-function mutation. It was uterus, where we found over 50% gain-of-function mutations in uterine carcinosarcomas, where ovarian and fallopian tube carcinosarcomas didn't have any meaningful mutations in specific subsets, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which really mirrors regular serous ovarian cancer. Mm -hmm. Serous ovarian cancer isn't marked by specific subsets of tumors that have you know, really treatable, targetable mutations. It's marked by random genetic entropy, random what we call genomic instability, where there's just, the rule is, there is no rule. Mm. In, in, what, in what the molecular changes are. Whereas in uterine cancer, there are defined subsets of specific types of tumors that have specific mutations that we believe make these tumors very susceptible to targeted therapies as well as immunotherapies. Carcinosarcoma is just at the sort of tip of that. And one of the reasons why is that in 2009, we changed carcinosarcomas from being a sarcoma classification mm -hmm. to an epithelial carcinoma classification. Mm -hmm. So all, Cancer Genome Atlas, all of the major clinical trials in carcinomas of the uterus excluded carcinosarcoma. They were excluded for years. Yeah. And it's only been in the last five to seven years that carcinosarcoma has been included with mm -hmm. epithelial cancers, and we're starting to think about them very differently. Mm -hmm. And this was largely because of work done in the early 2000s that basically looked at the molecular underpinnings of, of carcinoma mm -hmm. as well as carcinosarcomas mm -hmm. and found that what they think happens with carcinosarcomas, and this may be true of ovarian, we don't know, but it's probably true of endometrium, mm -hmm. is that they started as a carcinoma, as a high-grade carcinoma, like a serous carcinoma, Mm -hmm. And then they, as, as they grow, they de-differentiate or morph into something completely different at the same time. Mm -hmm. So you get what it looks like on the microscope is a tumor that has both sarcoma elements and carcinoma elements. In and the same cell? Or in, the same, no, in the same tissue. In the same tissue. Mm -hmm. So it almost looks like, they used to call these back like in the 80s, collision tumors. Right. As if it were two different cancers colliding together. And a lot of researchers, without knowing a lot of the molecular underpinnings, assumed the sarcoma probably is driving it, mm -hmm. when in fact it's probably the carcinoma mm -hmm. that's driving it. And that was really, that was really on an epidemiologic level or on a sort of clinical level scene because whenever these cancers metastasized to different parts of the body, it was usually the carcinoma that metastasized. Yeah. So we thought, well, that's more likely to be the egg and not the chicken. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And so we don't have definitive proof, but we believe now, based on our molecular studies of lineage, that likely these carcinosarcomas, the sarcomatous components, are derived from the epithelial components. And even in our study, we biopsied the sarcoma and biopsied the carcinoma and found excellent homology on a genomic level between those two things. Why not go after both? So. Well, the good news, that's a great question. Yeah. The good news here is that it looks like the molecular alterations that affect the carcinoma also affect the sarcoma. Okay. And it's just the way that they have differentiated that makes them different. Mm -hmm. Which means that if you can find a therapy that addresses the carcinoma, like a targeted therapy or an immunotherapy, mm -hmm. it's likely you're going to also 
hit the sarcoma as well. Okay. Which is where carcinoma sarcomas are different from pure sarcomas, like rhabdosarcomas, mm -hmm. like liposarcomas. Like there's a huge family of sarcomas that get treated with very different chemotherapy than we use with carcinoma sarcomas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so this is something that's definitely evolving. This is something that I think there have been dedicated clinical trials, not for ovarian carcinoma sarcomas, but for uterine carcinoma sarcomas. Yeah. Um, that was recognized that this was a separate type of cancer early, like in the 90s. Okay. And I think that ovarian carcinoma sarcomas, as we talked about briefly, a lot of times most of our clinical trials, unfortunately, have excluded ovarian carcinoma sarcomas mm -hmm. because they've wanted to create pure populations for clinical trials. Right. And there just weren't enough, enough basically incident cases to fill a trial and possibly have an impact. Mm -hmm. and so they got excluded. And a lot of our ovarian cancer treatment paradigms for carcinoma sarcoma are based on serous epithelial right. ovarian cancer yeah. paradigms. Whether or not that's relevant, we don't know. Mm -hmm. We're just not sure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Whereas in uterus, there definitely is yeah. dedicated trials. And there are some ongoing clinical trials right now. For uterine carcinosarcoma sarcoma that is specifically. Correct. Okay. And the big trial that we're waiting for compares two, basically two strategies of conventional chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. One's using a, a medicine called Taxol, along with a medicine called Iphosphamide. Exactly, I know. And that was established as a sort of our intergroup's standard of care mm -hmm. with the best response rates mm -hmm. and the best overall survival when compared to other regimens. Mm -hmm. We're now comparing that to carboplatin and taxol. So these two different regimens that both have taxol are being compared. We currently use carboplatin and taxol as our front line. A lot of times iphosphamide has fallen out of favor. It can be onerous to give. It's given over several days. It has a toxicity profile that's more than what we see with every three week carboplatin and taxol. And we think that based on retros well, based on smaller studies, that likely the response rates are the same, mm -hmm. if not maybe a little bit better. Mm -hmm. So we're confident that that trial will likely show equivalency mm -hmm. or at least non-inferiority with basically minimal, to that, much less toxicity. And that's for carcinosarcoma or is that for that's serous for, ovarian? That's for carcinosarcoma of the uterus. Of the uterus, got it. Okay. Because carcinosarcoma of the ovary doesn't have, as of yet, dedicated clinical trials. Interesting. Where you just have women that have carcinosarcoma of the ovary. Some trials lump them in, but most exclude them. So, we so they're two different entities. So it's really important to be able to differentiate between well, the diagnosis of ovarian carcinosarcoma versus uterine carcinosarcoma. You know what? I think that's a very important differentiation. Yeah. I think that it's a differentiation that sometimes is very hard to make. It would be based on a tissue sample, correct? It would be based on a tissue sample. It's sort of you look and see where things arose. Mm -hmm. We know that on a molecular basis, there probably are differences. Mm -hmm. And if you were ever wondering, did this come from the ovary? Did this come from the uterus? It would be nice to have a test you could do, right? some sort of molecular analysis. But the fact of the matter is, there likely isn't going to be a specific test. We're never going to be able to differentiate them perfectly.